increase the uh, accountability of government in Britain, uh, saw decentralization, devolving power to uh, local and regional governments as a big part of that. Uh, Ernesto Zedillo in New Mexico uh, said that uh, in order to democratize uh, the Mexican state, uh, the only answer was federalism. Here Boris Yeltsin and Mikhail Gorbachev both had good things to say about decentralization. And in fact, uh, more generally, one could say that, that enthusiasm for decentralization these days cuts across all sorts of barriers. Uh, people on the political right and people on the political left uh, both uh, very often believe that decentralization is a good thing. It also cuts across geographical barriers. There's really the enthusiasm for decentralization all over the world. And uh, one could even say that, that political decentralization has become one of these things like democracy or rule of law, which uh, is widely believed to solve all sorts of different uh, social or political problems. It's not just uh, rhetoric either. Uh, in all continents of the world in the last 20, 30 years, there have been numerous cases of countries uh, introducing reforms to decentralize government. That is to empower local and regional governments, uh, to introduce local elections where previously officials were appointed, and to create local or regional councils where none existed before. The faith in decentralization, I would say, has also taken root within international aid agencies and international development agencies, such as the World Bank, uh, the UN, and within national uh, development agencies like USAID. In, in some of these, uh, I would say enthusiasm for decentralization has gone beyond a belief to something more like a culture, where it's almost an unstated assumption that decentralization is going to be part of any uh, good reform program. When I tried for, for this book to estimate how much money was being spent by international agencies on uh, supporting decentralization programs, uh, it was difficult to, to pin down, but uh, the total clearly seemed to be in the billions. So a few years ago, I, I started on a project to try to understand uh, better for myself, with more precision, what are the consequences of political decentralization? And what one can say in general about, uh, about decentralization. And uh, this project was going to be primarily empirical. So I started out by collecting a lot of data on different types of decentralization in a large data set of countries. And then, uh, after collecting the data, I uh, gave myself a month or two to work out the uh, logic of the arguments about uh, political decentralization that I was going to try to test with this data. I wanted to try and model them formally where possible, uh, to check these arguments were internally consistent and uh, reasonably general. And instead of a month or two, that ended up taking uh, several years, and it became the heart of the book. Because despite my efforts, I could not find almost any arguments that were both logically valid and uh, likely to be at all general. And uh, this was uh, true both for arguments that decentralization was good, uh, of which there were many, and for the fewer arguments that decentralization had bad consequences. Even for arguments that did seem to hold under certain specific conditions, uh, the conditions were almost always so complicated and obscure that the arguments were unlikely to be useful for either empirical work or for policy advice. Either the conditions were so restrictive that they would hardly ever all hold, or they were, they were so obscure that it would be very difficult to determine in the real world whether or not those conditions held. Now, one argument did survive better than the others, to create a little suspense, I won't tell you at this point which it is. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Uh, but even that argument, which I do think is fairly general, uh, 
had unclear implications about whether decentralization was a good or a bad thing. It could be either. I then looked at empirical studies, having, having tried to think through this first theoretically, I looked at empirical studies, uh, studies of the consequences of decentralization, and found, as I had come to suspect, that there were almost no robust empirical findings. So what I want to do today is to take you through a few of the arguments that I examined and to see, assuming that you start with intuitions that decentralization is usually a good thing, to see if I can provoke you into at least becoming a little more skeptical about uh, this general faith in decentralization, that get you to challenge those intuitions. But first I should make clear that I am not arguing that decentralization tends to be bad. Uh, in fact, the arguments against decentralization seem to me to be uh, as partial and uh, inconclusive as the arguments uh, in favor of uh, decentralization. And I also think that the empirical evidence against decentralization, that it has bad consequences, was as, as weak and inconsistent as that uh, in favor of it. Rather, it's just that uh, uh, the consequences of decentralization seem to me to be complex and obscure. Many effects pull in different directions, leaving the net result indeterminate. So the bottom line, the, the basic conclusion that I came to for myself uh, after this, this exercise was that to choose to decentralize in most settings uh, requires a leap of faith rather than an application of science. There wasn't any really strong theoretical or empirical basis to think that a country would be better off if it decentralized its government. Uh, and to devote hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to persuading countries to decentralize and promoting decentralization, uh, given the current state of knowledge, seemed to me at least a little bit odd. So let me first try to make clear what I mean by decentralization, how I'm using the term in, uh, in the talk today. And uh, so I need to make a few definitions, to discuss a few definitions. First, what I call administrative decentralization uh, is the situation when some policies, and I should say to begin with, all cases of decentralization assume a multi-level government, so a government which, uh, or a state which consists of governments at a central level and at, at least one subnational level. So administrative decentralization exists if some policies are implemented not by the central government directly, but by locally based agents uh, who are appointed by and subordinate to the central government. And uh, one could say also that it's a kind of administrative decentralization if local agents make some policy decisions, but they're subject to being overruled by the center. So the center still has uh, the final decision-making authority. So that I call administrative decentralization. Now, distinguish this from political decentralization, uh, which can be broken down and turned into three types. And so, <coughs> so excuse me, subnational uh, decision-making decentralization exists if subnational governments, maybe one level, maybe more, have the exclusive right to make policy on at least one issue. That is, they can make policy which uh, cannot then be overruled by the central government. Appointment decentralization exists if some national officials are selected by local, uh, by, by local residents. And that might be democratically selected by local residents or undemocratically. And finally, constitutional decentralization exists uh, when some national governments have the right to participate in certain ways in central policy making. And an example of that would be the Russian Council of Federation in the late 1990s when the regional governors and the heads of the regional legislatures were ex officio members of the uh, Central Council of, uh, the Council of Federation participating in, in central policy making. So that would be a kind of constitutional decentralization. Political decentralization then for me is just one or more of those three types. And finally, people often uh, discuss what, what's called fiscal decentralization. And uh, I think it usually has two meanings, one of two meanings. 
the, the first possibility is decision-making decentralization, that is the right to make decisions without being overruled, on tax or expenditure issues. That's one meaning sometimes given to fiscal decentralization. Another meaning sometimes given to it is, is just uh, the situation where subnational governments account for a large share of total government revenues or expenditures. So those are my basic definitions. And uh, most of what I have to say will be about political decentralization today, but I'll start uh, with a few words about administrative decentralization. Let me just show you the outline of, of the talk uh, and uh, what I will uh, talk about, assuming I can get through it all. So first of all, I'll say a little bit about the administrative decentralization arguments about that. Then I'll very briefly run through the nine main arguments about political or fiscal decentralization that I discuss in the book. Then I'll focus a little bit more on two examples, uh, two, sets of, two particular sets of arguments. The first of these is arguments that uh, say that competition among local units for residents or capital uh, will lead to improvement of the quality of government and that in a decentralized state uh, that sort of competition among the subnational units uh, leads to positive outcomes. And then second, some arguments that decentralization either leads to democracy or improves the quality of democracy. Then I'll, I'll talk about a few possible objections uh, to my skeptical arguments about decentralization. After that, uh, if I have time, I'll say something about why I think political decentralization is so popular. If I'm right that there isn't a very strong scientific basis for uh, this presumption in favor of political decentralization, why do so many people have these strong intuitions, some of which I share, that decentralization is nevertheless a good thing? Where do those intuitions come from? I'll say a word or two about the cyclical nature of the debate because I think if you look at if you look back over time, yeah, you will be struck by how the same arguments keep coming back over and over again, and the same debates uh, revive uh, repeatedly uh, without there ever being any clear conclusion. Then finally, uh, maybe a bit presumptuously, I'll talk about what one might do as a researcher if one is nevertheless interested in political decentralization but comes to share my. Uh, opinion that there isn't very much that can be said in general about its consequences. So to start with administrative decentralization, so there are, to my mind, valid arguments associated with Montesquieu and more recently Wallace Oates, though one could also uh, relate this to, to uh, much earlier writers, even uh, Aristotle in a certain sense. So these are valid arguments about why it may be efficient for central governments uh, to appoint local agents, to divide up uh, governing uh, into different levels. And so the most uh, familiar argument is that it's just going to be more cost effective to produce some public goods uh, nationwide in the national unit uh, and other goods and other public goods at uh, small scale in local units if there are different uh, costs associated with different public goods, if there are economies of scale uh, in some and not in others. So that uh, motivates uh, the idea that there should be multiple levels of government, each with units of different size, providing different, uh, different uh, public goods. Um, now, there's no need in order to do that to have any kind of political decentralization. Uh, a, a, a state in which all decisions, are, all final decisions are made at the center, can still administratively decentralize so that public goods are provided at the most appropriate scale. And the second argument is that uh, tastes and costs of public goods may differ geographically, so different uh, local areas may have uh, different local communities, may have different preferences for public goods, they may want to have different bundles of public goods, or the cost of providing public goods may be different in different uh, local areas, and so it may be efficient to uh, have those local good public goods provided at the local level where you vary the amount, or, or even uh, where you produce different uh, uh, bundles of public goods in the different localities. Again, all that's required is administrative decentralization, 
not political decentralization, but I think these arguments are very reasonable. But what, what they imply when you think about it is that there are trade-offs between uh, factors that make one favor large scale of government and factors that uh, support smaller scale. So economies of scale in producing public goods lead towards larger units uh, and decentralizing. Um, but there are also costs of a decentralized structure, which people have pointed out, uh, which limit the extent to which one would want to multiply the number of tiers of government in order to capture those different uh, economies of scale. And there may be costs of organizing supervisory bureaus, costs of organizing governments at different tiers. Uh, there may be economies and diseconomies of scale in communication. If you have a state which has very many tiers of government, some people argue, uh, there's more potential for communication to get uh, garbled as messages are sent up and down the chain. And some people also argue that there's a risk of central loss of control if uh, you have a structure with many intermediate tiers. Other people argue that, and I would argue that there's no necessity for loss of control. There are mechanisms that can reduce that. But in any case, uh, the argument that different local public goods have different uh, optimal scales of production <coughs> suggests we want to have very many tiers of government uh, to capture it, to, to provide each local public good at the right scale. Um, but there are these other possible costs which would tend to reduce the number of uh, <coughs> levels of government that one would want. So the bottom line about administrative decentralization, as I see it, is that we can't, in general, say how many administrative tiers uh, are optimal, how many is best. Sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on, on the nature of the public goods for which there is demand uh, in a given society. Okay, what about political decentralization? So, as I said, there are many arguments why political decentralization is a good thing. And one uh, very famous argument associated, uh, <coughs> well, first with Hayek and later with Tibu, is that competition among local governments to attract uh, mobile residents or mobile capital uh, induces these local governments to be more <coughs> honest, more efficient, and more responsive. So this, this competition among the local units uh, leads to better government. The second argument, and now I'm just going to briefly run through these different arguments, uh, so you have them in your mind, and then I'll come back to some of them. Uh, the second argument is about fiscal incentives, and it says that, that if you increase, if you have a system of tax sharing, tax revenues are shared between different levels of government, if you increase the share in that shared tax, the shared tax uh, that is left to the local governments, that will motivate the local governments to support local economic activity, and that should lead to better performance nationwide. So this is another argument about why decentralization, in this sense, fiscal decentralization, is a good thing. Then there are a number of arguments about democracy, which are associated with such people as Jefferson, Tocqueville, Bill. I could uh, add on some other names there, too. And one uh, very old argument is that uh, in smaller units, citizens participate more in government, they're able to participate in government, and this cultivates civic virtue. Uh, so part of being a, a human being is, is to personally be involved in government, and this is only possible in small units. And so the next stage is to say, well, in a big state, uh, the only way people can participate in small units is if you have a decentralized government with lots of local units at the bottom tier. There are also arguments that say uh, decentralization leads to greater accountability uh, because, first of all, voters are said to know more about the performance of local government, so they can keep track better of local government, monitor better, and therefore uh, local government will be more accountable than central government. Uh, there's also an argument that if you divide up responsibilities between governments at different levels of the state, then it's easier to know who's responsible for what and to hold each government accountable for its own uh, responsibilities. Another argument is that voters in small groups can coordinate better. They can agree among themselves on what basis they're going to vote, and therefore that should help them uh, keep 
uh, government officials in line. So in, uh, there should be greater accountability in local governments, in small units, than in large ones. So those are arguments about democracy. There are also arguments about checks and balances and liberty, uh, very popular in the US uh, especially. And uh, the essential argument there is that strong local governments or state governments uh, can provide a check on the central government and uh, can protect individual freedoms from a central government that uh, is inclined to abuse uh, the citizens' rights. There are also ar arguments about local information and uh, innovation. So local governments are better able to obtain and make use of local information. Information said is naturally spread out, naturally dispersed. And so local governments, uh, or like local governments will be better able or maybe better motivated to make use of that local information, provide better uh, services. There are also arguments that decentralization should increase policy experimentation, that there should be more innovation in uh, a decentralized state because it's the local governments that are most innovative. Ethnic conflicts. So many people have argued that political decentralization should help to alleviate uh, conflicts between different ethnic groups. Uh, and for a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, decentralizing power may satisfy limited demands for autonomy by geographically concentrated or from geographically concentrated ethnic groups. Decentralization may also split up the prizes of politics. So different ethnic groups can have representatives in different uh, units of government, and so that could lower the stakes compared to a system in which uh, everybody wants to the death to win the single uh, most important prize in politics, the central uh, government. Decentralization, this repeating the argument about checks and balances, could also check a central government that uh, would otherwise abuse ethnic minorities. There are also arguments that uh, a decentralized political system is useful because it socializes ethnic uh, politicians into cooperative behavior, uh, so they get to participate at the local level uh, before meeting in central uh, arenas of politics where uh, ethnic conflict uh, might arise in a very dangerous form. And also, uh, Donald Horowitz has argued that, uh, that uh, uh, if you have a decentralized structure, you're less likely to get uh, nationwide ethnic parties which compete uh, in, in possibly violent ways. So a number of arguments that have positive implications that suggest that decentralization should be uh, a good thing, and, and in my view, these are very clearly the dominant ones, there's also one argument that I thought about which has, to my mind, neutral implications, uh, or neutral normative implications. And this, this is the argument that uh, veto players, that more veto players tends to reduce uh, change in policy. And uh, de political decentralization, by increasing the number of veto players, that is, actors in the political system that uh, can prevent policy change, by increasing the number of veto players, decentralization should tend to increase policy stability, make it harder to change uh, a, a policy that's already in place. Now, why do I say this has neutral implications? Well, because it's not clear whether you want more policy stability or you want more flexibility. Uh, clearly, at some points, it's better if policy can adapt to new circumstances. If in a crisis, uh, you can change policies. At other points, uh, perhaps you want policies to be locked in, especially if those policies are good. You want uh, long-term commitments, let's say, to low inflation to be credible. So sometimes policies, sometimes you want policy flexibility, sometimes you want uh, policy stability. And uh, so given that, you can't really say whether decentralization is going to be good uh, separate from the conditions. Okay, and finally, a couple of arguments about why decentralization is a bad thing. These have to do mostly with, with fiscal and macroeconomic uh, conditions. A uh, first argument says that, uh, that uh, decentralization creates sometimes harmful fiscal pressures, that strong local governments, politically strong local governments, tend to undermine fiscal and macroeconomic discipline, 
by pressuring the central government to provide more fiscal transfers, more aid of different kinds, uh, they, they, they uh, view the central government as a common pool. They all want to extract money from the center. None of them feels uh, an, all, an encompassing interest in, uh, but in budgetary stability at the central level. And uh, also this process of bargaining and pressure by lo strong local governments against the center uh, leads to soft budget constraints. So that's one argument about why decentralization is bad. And the second is about fiscal coordination. So if you have many different levels of government, or even two levels of government, uh, which each are able to tax the same base, uh, or are responsible for expenditures on, in the same area, then failures to coordinate between the governments can lead to suboptimal outcomes. Uh, they may tend to overtax if they're all able to tax the same base uh, because they don't coordinate. Uh, and so they, they tax even, even more than a unified uh, government would do. It's a collect collective action problem. Okay, so I've shown you nine arguments. Uh, six of them were that decentralization is good. One was that it has neutral implications. Two were that it's bad. So what's wrong with these arguments? Well, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all nine today, but I'll, I'll take two examples and uh, just run through my thought process as I was working through this book and uh, tell you what I think is wrong with arguments. Uh, first, about competition over residence or capital, and secondly, uh, uh, about decentralization of democracy. So first of all, competition, uh, competition among local governments to attract residents or to attract mobile capital, and I'll start with the arguments about uh, residents. And these arguments really begin from uh, an article by, by uh, Friedrich von Hayek in 1939, when he said that uh, the competition essentially between uh, local governments makes it impossible for the central government to interfere in economic life uh, and that competition forces governments uh, to avoid all sorts of taxation which would drive capital or labor elsewhere. So because local governments are worried that capital may leave or that residents may leave, they have to keep their tax rates low. They can't be as predatory as they might, might otherwise be. And in the context of mobile residents, this argument was developed uh, in a very famous article by Sean Thibault in 1956, who just sketched out the logic as, as it applies to a situation where individuals are perfectly mobile. So individuals can move from one locality to another, uh, and in th this case, in his words, the choice of where to live becomes a kind of uh, a consumer decision. So uh, it, it becomes like uh, going to the marketplace to choose the optimal for you bundle of public goods. Now, assuming that local officials benefit from having more residents, uh, they'll compete, so the argument goes, to, to attract residents by offering packages of local public goods and services at the lowest feasible tax cost. So there'll be the lowest taxes for the, to provide the particular bundle of public services Individuals will look around at the different uh, towns or, or local units and they'll, quote, buy the bundle of local goods and services that best matches their preferences. So they'll choose to live in the town which is providing the goods that they most prefer for the lowest uh, tax cost. And under certain conditions, competition among local governments to attract the mobile residents uh, should lead to an efficient use of resources to satisfy the demands for local public goods. It's just like in an efficient market. Okay, so this is a very attractive argument. It's, it's been incredibly influential uh, in, in public finance. It's clearly brilliant, uh, but there are some problems. And I'm not going to claim that what I'm going to say now is all original. There are a few uh, original bits, but mostly it's based on some very good work by a whole series of economists. So what are the problems? Well, first of all, to get these nice outcomes that, that Tibu foresaw, uh, 
a whole series of assumptions are necessary. And unfortunately, uh, I would argue, the assumptions will never hold. Now, with some of these assumptions, you still expect the positive effects of competition to show up just in weaker form. But if other assumptions fail, uh, it's completely unclear what we should expect to happen in equilibrium. And in some cases, there may not be an equilibrium, which uh, makes, it, ma makes the whole model uh, not useful for predicting uh, what should happen in a decentralized state. So to talk about some of these assumptions, in particular, uh, in order to get this uh, prediction of, a, of an efficient outcome from competition for, local, for mobile residents, uh, you need to assume that differences in taxes and public good provision aren't capitalized into real estate prices. That is, if one uh, town has really good schools, uh, you might think that would lead to property prices, to house prices, to be higher in that, uh, in that town. If for a given level of taxes, they're providing a much better service, educational service, then you might think that everybody would want to live in that town uh, to benefit from those educational services, from those good schools, and that would drive up the price of, of real estate, the price of houses in that town. Okay, if that does happen, then it undermines the logic of the Tipu argument, uh, at, least, uh, at least until you make some adjustments to it. Um, so why is that the case? Why does that matter? Because you get the discipline effect on government uh, because residents can gain by moving away from an inefficient government. So if a uh, government is not providing uh, good schools, given the amount of tax it's charging, then people will move away from that government to places where schools are better. And that mobility is what is supposed to discipline governments so that they all try as hard as they can uh, to provide public services well. But if the worst government uh, is associated with lower house prices, if pr house prices go up, in the places where the schools are good and go down in the places where the schools are bad, then there's no longer a motive for residents to leave, necessarily. Yes, the schools aren't very good, but they're compensated because the taxes that they pay uh, are lower. Or, I'm sorry, but because the rental payments are lower, so it doesn't cost them as much uh, to buy housing there. If they want to go to somewhere where the schools are very good, then they have to pay a whole lot more for a house. So they don't necessarily move, so the government doesn't feel this pressure uh, to improve its policies in order to keep residents or to attract new residents. <coughs> okay, so that's a, a pretty big problem. One can rescue the model by assuming that governments are controlled by real estate owners. Uh, that is, uh, people who really want house prices to be high uh, because they own the houses. And then you can see that they would want to pressure the government to have good schools uh, because that will drive up the, uh, the uh, value of their real estate investments. But, in fact, uh, governments aren't always uh, cartels of real estate owners. Uh, in fact, uh, in many countries, uh, uh, renters uh, are a large proportion of the electorate. Uh, and renters may, may uh, be quite happy with, uh, uh, with uh, the situation where property prices do adjust to quality of public services. And in addition, I would say, the argument really becomes a completely diff different one when you adapt it in this way and say the governments are cartels of real estate owners, because it becomes a government, uh, sorry, it becomes an argument about lobbying by uh, a certain interest group to get the government to provide good public services, rather than an argument about uh, specifically the pressures of mobility, and you could say, well, if, there, if you're assuming now that there's a lobby that will pressure government or, or, or negotiate with government to improve the quality of uh, educational provision under decentralization, why not make the same assumption under centralization? If you could just sort of assume a lobby, uh, a, a well-motivated lobby there, why couldn't you also do it under centralization? 
yes. The clarifying question. Yes. Actually, you're allowed. We are allowed to ask clarifying questions. Yes, I, I, I should have said. Uh, please, if you have clarifying questions, uh, feel free to ask during the during the talk, and maybe just hold back on uh, on uh, really major philosophical issues or <coughs> frontal attacks on the presenter until uh, the end, and then I'll be happy to take it. There's another way to align the incentives of the governments, and that actually is done in many a majority of uh, countries, which is uh, comprise the budgets of local governments of the real estate taxes. Um, yes, so you, you align the uh, interests of the local government with the property owners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that may work Not to some extent. Yeah. But there are also renters, um, which is sometimes even the majority. Um, and uh, again, I would say it's really an argument then about trying to uh, align incentives to create a lobby or to, create, to change the motivation of the, the local government, um, which doesn't require there to be uh, this uh, act very active competition uh, to attract new residents, which is really the essence of the TV walk. So it gets close to the argument about fiscal incentives, uh, even, I would say, uh, which I, I have other thoughts about. Um, okay, second key assumption for the TIBU uh, model. Well, you have to assume that uh, the only difference in government policies across the localities is differences in local policy. You have to assume that the central government doesn't provide different benefits or set different tax rates in different localities. Why does that matter? Well, if the central government is changing conditions in the different localities by setting different tax rates or providing different uh, policies there, then that breaks the link between what the local government is doing and the motive for people to move. Uh, so, People may, when they make their choice about where to live, may be influenced by the central government's policies rather than the local government's policies. In that case, then, in places where the central government is providing a lot of benefits, the local government may not feel any pressure to do a very good job, and, uh, and vice versa in the regions, in the units where the uh, central government is not providing many benefits. So the discipline on local governments will be weaker if the central government is discriminating uh, treating different regions differently, uh, so then empirical question, do central governments treat different regions differently? I think a moment's reflection will tell you the answer is yes. Then your argument is probably that central government uh, meddles with the margins, <coughs> right? Not, if central government treats uh, regions differently, but according right. to a pre-specified time constant formula, that won't be a problem as long as long local governments are uh, playing at the margin. Yes, if, okay. if uh, the central government doesn't change things year by year, if it just gives a sort of uh, a one-time block benefit to mm -hmm. certain regions, yes. Uh, I think that would be different, yes. Okay, so this, this uh, assumption is potentially problematic. A third assumption uh, necessary to, to make the model work Local governments use only head taxes. Uh, they charge only uh, a lump sum tax uh, on each person, who, uh, each resident. Uh, why do you need to assume that? Well, if, for instance, you, as you assume that uh, the local government charges proportional income taxes, uh, then there may be no equilibrium. And a good example to show that is if you think about the rich and the poor. So rich people would rather cluster with other rich people in a unit because if you have proportional income taxes, then their taxes will be lower. If the proportional income taxes provide a given set of services, the rich are going to end up paying more than the poor. So the rich will all want to live together uh, to lower their, their tax uh, contributions for a given level of services, but the poor will want to live with the rich because the rich will be paying more tax relative to their tax. Uh, so it will be a sort of uh, race in which the poor are constantly chasing the rich into new uh, units. I think this is not probably for the United States, but not about Russia. Typically, rich people choose where to live, and they uh, 
make such local communities where poor people cannot enter. Right. So yes, if if the rich are able to, to and this happens in the U.S. as well, to impose zoning regulations, so that you have a local regulation that says uh, your house has to be a certain size, and poor people can't afford houses that big, then it will, you find some other way to keep poor people out of the uh, locality. Then yes. Um, but so you need to introduce these other kinds of regulations, uh, which aren't in the in, in the model, and uh, and also if the rich are able to keep the poor out, then if people are not perfectly mobile, then all the other reasons that people might want to move related to uh, bundles of public services no longer are really determining all the uh, all the uh, mobility that's going on. So. Is it depend on the location of the tax revenue or your, your statement? Well, the, the, the assumption is that, that uh, to make the model work, you need uh, lump sum taxes on individual on residents. And yes, if you have different... Uh, different rules. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you've made three different poor people and three rich people with respect to allocation of the revenue. Right, so if, if uh, so the example was if the local governments have a proportional income tax instead of the, uh, the assumed head tax, uh, and income is the income of the individual based on his residence, then if there are poor people and rich people living in the same unit, then the rich will end up paying more than if there are just rich people to provide a given level of public services. And the poor will like this and which one. So yes. So but the, so that there could be a, a, an equilibrium in this case. It depends. There, there's a paper which says that there, it, it, yeah. it depends on parameters, but there, well, it, the point is that maybe there wouldn't be an equilibrium. Whereas Tipu, if you have just head taxes under certain people, and all these other assumptions hold, then you do get an equilibrium. So that's. Can, can this mobility be regulated by the price of real estate? Real estate is, the, is more expensive in those areas where we, where we rich live, and they are the only ones who can afford it. Um, well, yes, of, of course, you know, larger houses are larger. If you can find a way to keep people out, uh, if perhaps you find some way to put an extra cost into real estate in certain places, perhaps you could do that. Um, but but what, what you're getting at is ways to sort of adapt the model, which might help. Um, and I'll just keep going through it. I think you'll see that there are all these assumptions that uh, each would have to be adapted in certain ways, uh, which require sort of ad hoc additional assumptions, and most of which would, are really not possible to rescue. Um, okay, a another assumption, which is a little bit similar to the last one, the identity of residents must not affect the cost of providing public goods. And for instance, if you think about, well, let me let me give you the following example. Following example, if uh, so, so uh, protecting people's property is more expensive if your community is full of criminals than if it's full of honest people, right? So the cost of providing the public good depends upon characteristics of the residents. So you might think that criminals would all want to live near rich people, but the rich people don't want to live near criminals. So you get this sort of chase going on, a bit like the rich and the poor. Um, and you get mobility for reasons which have nothing to do with the quality of the public service. Uh, and the cost of the public service would be quite different in different regions in a way which, uh, which really doesn't uh, follow from how hard the local government is trying to produce good public goods. So this discipline effect of mobility on local governments also may disappear. Does it depend on the number of uh, policemen in different uh, regions? Well, for a given number of policemen, <laughs> uh, we're assuming that the tax cost is the same in the different regions. So you're absolutely right. I mean, all of these... The problems with the assumptions depend on many uh, factors, and that also shows that the assumptions themselves depend on many uh, additional uh, factors. And, and the model, my main point is, only goes through if all of these sort of demanding assumptions hold. 
I would say if, it's, if some of them fail, you can still expect something of the logic to remain. But if others don't hold, there may be no equilibrium, in which case you just don't know uh, what's going to happen with the model just isn't useful. Okay, from those and other considerations, uh, and, and I have a more detailed uh, discussion of all these assumptions in the book, but from these and other considerations, uh, it seems to me that competition would often be weak or non-existent, and it could be distorted by numerous intervening or offsetting factors like this, these, these ones that we were just talking about, so that the competition wouldn't necessarily uh, impose the, the right kind of discipline on the local government. If competition exists, it may lead to undesirable rather than desirable government behaviors. I didn't talk about this yet, but you can imagine uh, negative externalities. If a government is trying to attract local residents by doing something which is costly for residents of other units. And then finally, even if competition is intense and focused on desirable behaviors, uh, there will often be no equilibrium for, for reasons, some of which I mentioned. It. There are other reasons why there may be. No equilibrium. And finally, uh, which to me is, a, is, is, is perhaps even more important, if the t boom mechanism works well under decentralization, then under centralization, a central government uh, could replicate the mechanism. It could choose local policies as if to maximize the profits of local managers, or to maximize uh, inflows of residents uh, into each unit. And so when achieve the same outcome. So if the TBU logic is right, and decentralization is this wonderful mechanism which causes local governments to behave well, uh, a central government could implement exactly the same thing. Okay, so that's the argument about uh, competing for mobile residents. I'll now move to competing for mobile capital, but first... Right, just, just one point about the uh, TBU model. I think, the, like, to me, I, I, I understand your arguments, certainly, and I subscribe to most of them, but I think, to me, the most important criticism of the TBOO model is that it, uh, the absolutely first and essential assumption of it is pre-mobility of citizens, which actually is not the case in most of developing countries, where there are many legal, economic, and other constraints which actually, you know, basically uh, inflate the citizens within the country. Absolutely. So, so that is yet another assumption that is unrealistic in most countries, perhaps more realistic when you're talking about very small units within the U.S., but you know, one assumption is that there's no cost to mobility, and there always is some sort of cost, uh, transaction costs if nothing else, and selling a house and buying a new one, and just costs of, of moving, transportation, and so on. And often there are much more serious uh, political obstacles to moving. Yes, so, so yes, I just gave you a few of the assumptions that are problematic. I could extend the list uh, to at least uh, 10 or 12. But what about the argument about mobile capital? That's a little bit different than the argument about mobile residents. So now uh, the, the, the argument is that local governments will be afraid that if they don't uh, reduce their waste, reduce corruption, if they don't uh, provide growth-promoting infrastructure, business-friendly policies with low taxes, then all the, all the investors are going to go somewhere else. So they have to be, have, have sort of good, liberal, uh, business-friendly policies uh, under decentralization, because otherwise uh, they'll lose all their capital. It's a simple, attractive idea, but series of questions. First of all, will the competition actually occur for capital? And I'll, in a second, say something about that. If competition does occur between the different units uh, to attract investors, uh, will that induce good behavior, quote, good behavior under some criteria, uh, or will it induce bad behavior, that is, behavior that doesn't increase uh, welfare? And if it does, if, if, uh, if competition occurs and it induces good behavior on the part of local governments, would equally attractive outcomes occur under centralization? So first of all, will competition actually occur? Well, not necessarily if the different regions are quite heterogeneous. And I have a paper with Hong Bin Kai, which has a little model which, which just makes this point. If one region is much more productive than the others, uh, that region will attract uh, most or all of the capital without even trying. Uh, if it has some endowment, uh, 
which makes it just much more exogenously attractive, then even if the uh, less well-endowed region tries really hard to attract the investment, it reduces waste, corruption, it invests in infrastructure, it still won't be able to attract capital from the uh, exogenously much more attractive place. So you can think, in fact, in this paper, I looked at Russian regions, and you could say, well, uh, no matter what the Republic of Tuva does, uh, it's not going to attract uh, a whole lot of uh, banks to set up their headquarters in there rather than in Moscow. Uh, and you can think of many reasons why. The location, uh, prior conglomerations of business and so on. So you need to have fairly even initial endowments between the units to get competition. Otherwise you get polarization in which there's perhaps even less incentive for the less well endowed units uh, to compete by improving their government than if capital was not mobile and uh, was trapped within the units. So that's, this is what I just said. The less productive region may be even less disciplined uh, and uh, some regions simply can't compete with other regions just because of the exogenous endowments that the uh, more attractive regions start with. So competition may not occur, but if it does occur, will it lead to better behavior? Not necessarily. Um, if you think about it lower, if the local governments are kept by this competition from extracting rents, that may just leave more rents for the central government to extract. Uh, and in some, some models, that's exactly the outcome you should expect. So government as a whole doesn't become better, it just changes the level uh, at which most of the corruption occurs. And a competition, another problem is the competition among the local units to attract capital may distort the allocation of local spending towards business services, things that capital likes, away from services that perhaps labor or the, the, the voters uh, would prefer. And it may, the competition between the different units to attract investment uh, may cause them to lower their taxes below the level that's actually necessary to finance the public services that the voters or that the uh, local residents would want. This is often called the race to the bottom. It could reduce welfare. So competition may not actually lead to good outcomes. Another reason is that uh, competition could lead the units to uh, compete by imposing negative externalities on their neighbors. Uh, perhaps they'll get more investment if they lower their pollution controls. They say people who set up a factory can uh, pollute as much as they like because most of the pollution goes to other regions. Uh, so competition can, ha can, can have outcomes which are, for the country as a whole, uh, welfare reducing. It, it can also lead to, uh, to waste in the sense that if all the units in the country are competing to attract a given amount of investment, uh, then they may spend a lot lobbying the investors, competing to get the investors in unproductive ways, and the net uh, result for the country as a whole is no different. The investment was going to go to one of the regions, uh, but the regions have just spent a whole lot on trying to advertise and attract the investors uh, to them in particular. Another way that uh, local governments could compete is by blocking enforcement of central laws. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in, in Russia at times, I think that uh, regional governments have tried to protect enterprises that are located in their region uh, from, this is in the late 1990s, from paying their full taxes to the central government. So that's another way that uh, competition uh, among the regions to attract capital could lead to outcomes that are not necessarily good for the country as a whole. Uh, you might say that's, that's a good thing if, uh, if, if the regional governments prevent uh, enterprises from paying their full taxes to the central government because the central government just wastes the money. Uh, but if the central government provides some services which are actually necessary, they may not be able to do that uh, if they're unable to collect taxes because this competition among the regions to attract capital has caused them to undermine the center's administrative capacity. So competition among local governments for capital may not lead to desirable behavior, and if it does, uh, 
same final argument as in the case of mobile residents, the government of a centralized state could replicate the local competition mechanism and get the same attractive results. So, conclusion, no general reason, as I see it, to think that decentralization will generate uh, a desirable kind of competition for residents or capital that would lead to better local <coughs> government behavior and overall efficiency. Now, since uh, time is going by, I think I'm going to skip uh, all the arguments about democracy, and I'll be very happy to talk about them uh, later if, uh, if you're interested, but I'll skip ahead so that we have time to talk about why people love. Why people love. First of all, some possible objections, and then why I think people have these intuitions that favor decentralization. So first possible objection, to, to, and, and you have to imagine that you've just read like attacks on nine arguments comparable to the uh, attack I've just made about this one argument. Uh, so why might people object to this, this line, of, uh, line of thinking? Well, you might say no institutions always work. Uh, so it's unfair to single out decentralization. You could make the same sorts of criticisms of democracy or free markets. So markets sometimes fail. Democratic governments sometimes do terrible things. Uh, there are occasionally autocrats that are benevolent. Uh, so the fact that, that the arguments about democracy and market competition aren't completely general uh, doesn't mean that we should just give up on markets and democracy. So my response to that, uh, I'm somewhat sym sympathetic to that, that line of, of uh, response. Uh, my response first that democracy, and to some extent free markets, uh, are valued in themselves, independent of consequences. There are actual, uh, democracy is a value. It's not just something that we like because we believe it has certain good consequences. It's, I think, hard to say that of, of uh, decentralization. Um, and I would say that, uh, that the parallel is actually quite a good one in the in the past few decades, recognizing the failures of markets and the failures of democracies has led to some of the most interesting work in economics and political science. And uh, perhaps we should stop simply assuming that decentralization is good and we should try to rigorously examine the, the failures just as people have rigorously thought about market failures. So maybe it's uh, the analogy actually suggests one should pursue this, this line of argument further. The second uh, reply that I sometimes get is, is that, well, uh, of course, decentralization isn't always good. It's got to be well designed, and it's got to be introduced under the right conditions. And uh, the problem for me is that nobody seems to be able to tell me what the right conditions or the right design are. So, what, so I've looked through uh, as many works as I could find to see what scholars who make this argument me, what, what uh, conditions do they identify as being necessary for decentralization uh, to work well? And some of the things they say are necessary are things that would help in any setting. Things like transparency, popular participation, the rule of law. Uh, so they say you only, you'll only, decentralization will only work well if you have transparency. Well, if those things improve the working of decentralization, they should also help under centralization. It's not clear how they affect the comparison between the two. Uh, any system should work better, I think, with transparency. You do not take into account taste of knowledge. Taste of knowledge. Yeah, taste of knowledge. So the knowledge is, uh, could not be formally uh, uh, described, but uh, nevertheless so, it exists. So this is an argument about local, local information, local knowledge, um, which I do deal with in the book. Uh, that's, yeah, uh, my, uh, my response to that is that what really deals well with unstated local knowledge is markets. Uh, and the... And decentralization as well. I, I, I would, I, to, to answer that properly would take probably about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. But I have okay. a chapter in the book about exactly that, uh, uh, exactly that argument and why I don't find it compelling. But yeah, it's, it's also a very intuitive one, I think, with, with, with a lot of great literature about it. So another set of, 
of, of these conditions that people say are necessary for decentralization to work well are things that can't be directly observed. The things like political resolve. Uh, decentralization only works if the if the if the po politicians, the reformers, have political resolve uh, and if or political will. If decentralization, but the problem with this is it's circular. So if decentralization fails, you can say this is because the uh, leaders didn't have uh, political resolve. But how do we know they didn't have political resolve? It's not something you can measure independently. We know that because decentralization failed. So that doesn't really help me much as a condition. Then there are some tautological conditions. So the condition for decentralization to be successful is the abs absence of a bad supposed consequence of decentralization. So for example, uh, decentralization uh, will only work well it's often said in, in World Bank uh, papers, if there are hard budget constraints on local governments. Okay, but there's a literature which suggests that decentralization itself leads to soft budget constraints on local governments. Um, other conditions, necessary conditions, for decentralization to work well have this sort of deus ex machina uh, quality. So decentralization works well when some unnamed force makes it work. Uh, and here's, here's an example from the World Bank paper. The condition for successful decentralization is that sound intergovernmental rules are in place to restrain arbitrary action at the central and local levels. So where these sound rules come from is, is unclear, and how they're enforced is unclear. But if, if they are enforced, then yes, uh, you don't need to worry. And then finally, what, what I find Oddest of all is, is sometimes people say that what's necessary for decentralization to work is a sophisticated, benevolent central government. <laughs> so, so decentralization will work well only if central government is, quote, able and willing to steer the institutional change in the direction of a more democratic and efficient society. This is from one paper. But if the central government is sophisticated and benevolent, uh, why do you need decentralization? <laughs> okay, so the honest answer, in, in, in my view, uh, so this is from one group of World Bank uh, scholars, some, some very, uh, very serious, impressive scholars. They have been working on decentralization for many years. And their conclusion now is that we may not be able to say exactly what the correct form of decentralization is for a particular country, but we do know that correct institutional incentives are essential. So if we know that the correct design is essential, but we don't know what the correct design is for a given country, uh, should we perhaps you know, take a break from advising countries to decentralize? The uh, less impressive type of answer that I see, uh, that I often see, is uh, exemplified by this statement from the US uh, Agency for Inter International Development report, which says, Essentially, that uh, they don't know if decentralization uh, works, that it can have a lot of bad consequences, um, but full steam ahead, they're going to continue uh, programming decentralization um, uh, because a successful programming is a continual learning process. Okay, uh, finally, uh, since we have very little time left, gone on far too long. I'll just say a few words very quickly about why I think people have these intuitions uh, and then I can come back to those if uh, there's a question on it. So first of all, I think there's a lot of guilt by association. Some really bad people have liked centralized government. Uh, <laughs> Robespierre, Stalin, and Hitler. When we think about centralized government, we usually think about really nasty authoritarian systems. Then there are these sort of romantic images of life in the village, everybody dancing around and, and, uh, in the New England township of the Athenian Polis. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're not always very realistic. Then there's the cultural hegemony of the federal U.S. In the U.S., federalism is a really big thing, so there's lots of economic models which show you why federalism is a really good thing. Analogies to the market. This comes back to the point a second, a second ago. So Tibu is explicit in comparing decentralized government to the market. Uh, people, to my mind, misapply Hayek's argument about decentralized information uh, and say that that also applies to local government, but uh, I would argue that governments are quite different from the market, whether they're central or local, and what works really well is the price system. There's no real thing that corresponds to the price system in government. 
Uh, finally, people sometimes like decentralization because they associate it with diversity, which is a good thing. But you can have diversity in unitary system systems. Then people finally retreat to the great political theorists, which is a good place to retreat to, uh, who have written things very positive about decentralization. But go and read them again, and you'll find that what they say is highly conditional and highly context specific. And uh, so I could give you examples. Centralization, decentralization, there's a continually reviving, inconclusive debate. Uh, a quote from 1861, a quote from 1921. <laughs> People always keep saying that decentralization is a really interesting, important question. Uh, they never seem to get the, the answer, and these same arguments keep coming back. The same thing in politics. There's a great paper by somebody called De Vries, which looks at party manifestos in England, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands, and finds that every 10 or 15 years, there's a new attention to decentralization. <laughs> so finally, what sort of research could you do? Should you stop studying decentralization? No. Uh, well, one possibility is to just keep looking for what these unstable so far conditions are that make decentralization work well. I'm a little skeptical about that. Another thing is to study the logic of decentralized or centralized institutions in particular settings, just not to expect the results to generalize, to try and learn about Russia by studying decentralized institutions there, rather than thinking it'll teach you about uh, all such institutions. Maybe it's time for us to be a bit more skeptical about general effects of institutions in general. Uh, sorry, institutions. So uh, Burke uh, has this great uh, quote about constitutions, that perhaps we should think of constitutions as not a, a mold that, that uh, shapes society, but a vestment which accommodates itself to the body. And then finally, what should policymakers do if there's no solid reason to think decentralization will always be better? Well, it depends on your starting point. If things are already very bad, you may want to decentralize or centralize to try something new, um, even if uh, you don't know for sure what the consequences will be, it's, it's more worthwhile to take a risk when your starting point is really bad. Okay, I'll stop there. Sorry for going on so long. Happy to take that. Thank you very much. And let's uh, get to uh, have question and answer session. And we'll do that to the, the more or less centralized uh, session. Uh, keep your hands up, sort of indicate when I uh, put you down, uh, then I'll uh, indicate Scott. So, um, maybe put you on the st spot, Dan, and, and give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, democracy as well. So, is there anything that we can, uh, could perhaps have expected uh, or perhaps uh, know about the consequences of the elimination of gubernatorial elections in Russia? No. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I could give you the reasons why I don't think that decentralization is, uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me restate that. I think eliminating democracy uh, is bad, and to that extent, eliminating elections is bad. But one can have centralized democracies how do in know which... It? How, do, how do I know it? How do I know that you can have centralized democracies? No, 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 the, the elimination of the democracy is, is bad. How do I know it? Why, why, why this is no, the, the, question, the question is how the elimination of the gubernatorial election uh, right. implies, uh, affects the uh, democracy. Right. right. Well, it, elections are in themselves part of democracy, so one could say that uh, it's more democratic to have governors elected. But does that mean that the system as a whole will work better? And does it mean that you could not have a perfectly democratic system in which the governors were appointed? No, that could also be democratic. Um, so I can't give you a, a, a very fine yeah. argument, but I would say there is a reason for a presumption in favor of democracy, as, as, as I understand what we know at this point. Um, that's perhaps more a question about increasing democracy at a certain level. Okay. Uh, I, I think you've done something, actually, which is not on this list of Stodialat. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, okay? Which is, I thought the real contribution of the Kai Priestman paper is that you found conditions under which decentralization will not work well. And as you keep finding out more and more about that, you're actually contributing to understanding 
of the conditions under which you should not decentralize, and that's an advance in science, right? And I think um, you, you have this result about the difference in endowments, and once you exceed some threshold, it's going to go really badly, right? That's an advance in our understanding about decentralization. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in the capital controls debate, we have learned through hard experience in East Asia that you should not liberalize capital flows if you don't have good bank regulation. Right? And that seems to me one of the few promising areas where we can understand a little better what the consequences of decentralization could be. Just, I'm just suggesting this to you and you might disagree. Right. Uh, no, I think, it, I think research has shown that under certain conditions we should not expect decentralization to work as well as some previous arguments suggested. Now, what that implies about our general position on decentralization is, is a little more complicated. Um, if one, the, the, what I've been doing here is suggesting that there's, there's perhaps no reason to think that decentralization uh, would have the positive effects that have been attributed to it. Um, and so showing that there is yet another reason why one argument doesn't work um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we disagree. It's, it, it's useful, and I would say more work is probably useful, to question the assumptions of arguments about decentralization, perhaps to show when they don't hold. Um, but that doesn't really give you a, a very clear policy important answer, because it doesn't necessarily mean that centralization would work either. Right, but I think you've saved some countries some very adverse consequences. Suppose some countries have huge regional disparities. Right. You've saved them the trouble of experimenting with decentralization with the paper. So that's a positive contribution. Countries that might otherwise have liberalized, or decentralized rather, will now not decentralize, hopefully, if this has any policy effect. Well, you're complimenting my paper, so I can't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I see the point. Okay, right. yeah. 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 I just would like to intervene and also sort of, uh, talk about some other parts of contributions, perhaps, and I'd like to know what your uh, uh, assessment of those are, because you haven't really talked of, uh, in the book much about Riker and Riker's argument, because as, as I understand Riker's argument, he basically understood the sort of, uh, he basically thought through the Tibu model, he understood very well the importance of externalities, and at the same time, he actually bought, unlike you, but he did buy the argument of information. And uh, I would say that I probably would buy it too, the information advantage of local governments. So if you basically trade off uh, information and other possible uh, advantages of this, uh, decentralization to the uh, disadvantages like externalities, local capture, what have you. So Riker's argument was that you actually can provide this sort of unified model which basically explains why some integrations work better, some integrations work worse. And his answer was that we really need to have uh, local governments being interested in the sort of national agenda, if you will. And his, his uh, answer was uh, strong political partners. And, uh, well, you know, to the extent uh, we, we can uh, think about quite a lot of examples, that, that to me seems to work rather well. Moreover, you know, I think that the systematic evidence also is in favor of that, although it's subject to many criticisms in terms of identification. So what, what's your view? Um, well, for one thing, Riker had different views in different books, in different periods. But his main argument for parties that, uh, I guess, centralized parties are useful in a decentralized state. So there are certainly some countries where that seems to be true. Um, I'm not quite sure. You know, I, 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 I haven't thought very much about that in particular, but I have no reason to think that that argument is more general than any of the others. Well, in that sense, I mean, that, that just uh, the reply to that would be, of course, this is true, but, you know, no models, as you pointed out absolutely correctly, you know, are genuine. There's not a single model in, in, in the world which is genuine. So the question is whether the models uh, work relatively well or they fail in most cases. 
varieties and, and models. The model seems to fail in most cases. The question is whether the micro model fails. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm not convinced by the empirical evidence that decentralized countries with strong parties are necessarily better on some criteria. And in part, it depends, you know, it's very difficult, first of all, to define and secondly, to measure what is a strong party. Um, when in addition, would one a, a model which would really predict this, even when you take into account a lot of the things which are usually left out of the models. And, and one basic problem about decentralization is that there are so many arguments, each of which implies different effects, uh, that to have a supermodel which would combine all the different arguments would just be completely intractable. But the real world is like that. So one might expect a certain logic to work if you hold constant all these other effects. Um, but if you're not holding constant all these other effects, you shouldn't expect it to, to work in any general way. Um, so, yeah, I can't, uh, I didn't focus very much on the argument about parties because I didn't, I didn't see very powerful convincing evidence, robust evidence, uh, that this made a huge difference, and I wasn't sure what the underlying logic was. Uh, so, yeah. okay. yeah, I, I have two quick questions. One, uh, yeah, okay, um, uh, one, uh, one is about impact of modern technological revolution. Uh, what does the progress in information technology imply for the federalism? Now you can uh, read the blogs of federal ministers, regional ministers. You can uh, watch elections online through webcams or whatever you can get it. So does that have an exogenous it's an exogenous variation that may have an impact. Another question is global governance. Uh, we start from the position of an extremely decentralized global state, if you like. And uh, this is a very heterogeneous federation. So your theory suggests decentralization is bad. Uh, this system doesn't tackle the big issues in a reasonable way. Why don't we see a global government emerging to some extent? Uh, okay, two, two very good, difficult questions. Um, information, well, if you, if you were to buy the arguments that local government deals better with information because information is naturally dispersed, then the fact that so much more information is becoming available and distance doesn't make uh, such a difference anymore would suggest that that argument is, is less applicable that now uh, people can get all the information they want perhaps about central government. But that's to take a fairly technical view of information. And the main reasons I'm not convinced by the arguments that information is naturally dispersed and then therefore local government is, is better, is that information, uh, uh, obtaining information is not just a technical task. It's a strategic uh, task. And so then the question is whether uh, in local units, uh, either local governments are you know, better strategically at extracting information from the population, if that's what's necessary, or local communities are better at monitoring uh, officials than a national community. And when you look into those arguments about the strategic element of information extraction, uh, it, it becomes much less clear that the size of the unit really is what's crucial and there, there, there are other effects which would lead in favor of centralization, such as the uh, greater resources of the press at the national level than at the local level often, and the, the uh, greater concentration of investigative journalism. Um, so, you know, the, the change, the technological change in information should affect some of these arguments about decentralization uh, I may be the wrong person to ask because I don't think the arguments are, are convincing to begin with. So my sense is that this doesn't uh, really change our basic uncertainty about what will work better. About global governance, my so one argument that I have about uh, about a world in which there isn't much of a central government 
is that capital mobility won't necessarily work as well. This is the argument that the Chenko mentioned. Capital mobility won't necessarily work as well if there are big differences in uh, endowment, as I mentioned in the talk. Um, to the extent that the world is made up of countries which have very different endowments, that might suggest that uh, an argument against total capital mode, uh, total lack of capital controls is that the poor countries will simply lose capital to the rich countries uh, and it won't necessarily have any positive effect on government. Now there are other arguments about why you might want capital mobility uh, to, to do with allocation and, and uh, other things, but just looking at the argument about disciplining government, uh, you know, it, that argument might apply. Uh, now why don't we see the emergence of a world government but doesn't necessarily see the emergence of the organization that would be more efficient. And I also uh, want, to, want to emphasize, I don't necessarily think that centralization is better in any, uh, in any sense. Um, uh, it's just that sometimes one is better in some regards, sometimes the other is better in some regards, and often we don't know the conditions that are determining this. And if we did know them abstractly, if we could put them in a model, the quantities are not directly observable, uh, so we're moving in the dark. So I, we don't see the emergence of the world government probably uh, for political reasons, um, but uh, it not, wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. Right, please. Last round of questions. Why do you prefer uh, decentralization without the institutions such as democracy and uh, um, free markets? They say that. Uh, don't see the value of decentralization by itself. But if we think about in this case, as you suggest, global governance, or uh, for example, states with huge uh, ethnical uh, segregation, then uh, probably the decentralization could have uh, value in itself. And this course, for example, as extreme case when the value of uh, this kind of uh, very dramatic uh, decentralization. I also have uh, uh, the following question. Okay, I, I take your uh, big point that nothing is genuine. So, okay, if you if you take that, then maybe another interesting question, and just as you point out, is uh, to go to very specific circumstances and try to see what's driving there. So, my question is, do you have any insights? for us on why the U.S. works so well? Is that taboo or is that information? Or what drives U.S.? Uh, what drives uh, Switzerland? What drives China? I mean, just do we know, like, of all the array of all the arguments, what is actually the defining argument in all those type of uh, questions? Right. Sure. Sure, okay, so the, the first... Okay. Okay, so the first part was about ethnic divisions and Kosovo, for instance. Yes, uh, so decentralization might be good when there are extreme ethnic divisions in a country. Um, when I looked at the arguments for this, you could come up with reasons why that wouldn't necessarily help. That uh, decentralization could actually empower ethnic minorities rather than integrating them. That it might set up political... Uh, blocks which would then be more prone to conflict. I mean, my point isn't that it necessarily would, but... And what about value? As value a value of decentralization itself. I don't see the... Right. I mean, I, I guess you could say that there's a basic value of self-determination by an ethnic unit or by a nation. So you could say there's a value for national self-determination. Self-identification, what it's called. Right. Russian. Right. Um, so that might be an argument for having independent states for each nation. So it could be nationalism. Um, to some degree. You could say that decentralization is, is uh, the only way that the interests of nationalism can be observed in a multi-ethnic state. So perhaps, yes, perhaps that's right. That perhaps you can say that uh, a unit like the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire uh, can be admired because of the way it respected the value of uh, 
cultural self-determination by different ethnic units. Um, okay, I'd be willing to go at least halfway uh, with you on that. The question why things are so good in the U.S. I mean, it's a huge question which I'm not qualified to answer, but my in instinct is to say that it has nothing to do with decentralization. That in fact, the U.S. perhaps would work better if it was a little less decentralized in some ways. Um, and that Britain works pretty well too, uh, whereas it's considered one of the most centralized of the democracies. So I would say, what, you know, just, just sort of quick superficial answer to why the U.S. Uh, does so well has to do with culture and economic development. Um, but I wouldn't attribute it necessarily to decentralization. It's true that if you look at the U.S., local governments seem to work better than local governments in many other places. But that may just be because of the fact that it's a more developed uh, democratic country than many others, rather than something specific about local government there. And it also may be true that local governments there would work even better if they had less autonomy. So that's, that's just my uh, intuitive answer, which could be wrong. Uh, but uh, that's, that's all I can say. My preference would be to continue that for another three or four hours, actually, because I have a lot of questions, and I'm sure you are most of you. Another eight, eight arguments. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe an hour and a half for arguments. So, but uh, let's uh, just move that uh, discussion slowly to the, uh, wine and cheese reception. Uh, there's the wine and cheese reception where we can do that a little more informally, but before that I would like to thank Dan for his wonderful talk and uh, please join me.